Up to this point, we've been working on applications of integration that are mostly geometric, finding the volume or length or surface area of different geometric objects. Now we're going to shift into physics applications, how we can use integrals to answer questions from physics. We're going to deal with two applications, work and hydrostatic force. We'll spend most of our time on work and then a little bit on hydrostatic force at the end. The key idea of work is that it's when we apply a force over a distance, work is done. Now work is a little bit of an artificial construct. When you study physics, we can talk about energy, for instance, and the energy of a system is basically a system for us to account for different things changing and as a situation unfolds, we can talk about the energy in a system at different points. For instance, if you roll a rock down the hill, you can talk about at the top of the hill, the rock has potential energy, and then as it rolls down the hill, it picks up kinetic energy as its speed picks up. And as it rolls down the hill, it loses that potential energy because it's dropping, but it's gaining kinetic energy at the same rate. And between those two and then energy loss to friction and sound and things like that. We talk about energy being conserved over the whole system. So energy is really just an accounting system we use to track situations like that. And it's a really useful one because we can take a wide variety of problems and we might have a hard way of answering a question. Like for instance, what's the speed of the rock at the bottom of the hill? We could do some calculations with different formulas or if we recognize this idea of energy, we could just compare the potential energy at the top of the hill and the kinetic energy at the bottom, ignoring for a minute the energy loss to heat and sound and so on. And we can get a pretty decent answer for its speed. So energy is a really useful tool because it lets us answer harder questions in an easier way. And work is related to energy because as work is done, energy is transferred around the system. So work is a little bit artificial. Um, there's not a work measurement you can do. It's more of an artificial construct we apply to a situation. But the way we define it is if you apply a force over a distance, then you can calculate the work. And the simplest case is when there's a constant force being applied. In the example I've drawn here, we have a cart that we're dragging from one location to another. And as we drag it along with a constant force, if we assume that force doesn't change, and we measure the distance we've traveled, the constant force work is just equal to force times distance. So the calculation is really simple if the force is constant. For example, let's say you lift a 50 pound bag four feet. The work done is just 50 pounds times four feet or 200 pound feet or foot pounds, depending on who you talk to. So if there's a constant work being done, in that case, as you lift the bag, its weight doesn't change. And so the work is simply the force times the distance traveled. Where things get interesting and where calculus comes in is when the force is not constant. Because if the force isn't constant, it kind of goes all the way back to when we started learning integrals. And if we had a function like this, that we wanted to find the area underneath, there's no calculus really needed because you can find the area of that using the area of a rectangle. So if a constant function is the one you're looking at, the area underneath it needs no calculus. You could do the problem with calculus, but you'd be doing more work than you really need to do. It's when functions are changing and we have something more like this, that's when we need to apply the principles of calculus and that's when an integral is necessary to find the area.
So let's apply the same kind of thinking here. Back then, we said, okay, if we want to calculate the area of this complicated curved function, we can split this into small rectangles. And if you think carefully about what we do when we define a rectangle, what we're really saying is, pretend for a second that this function was flat right here. Let's split it into a tiny little slice and assume the function is constant right here. And that's the same thing we've done with all of the integration applications so far. With the volumes of disks and washers and shells and so on, every time we divide it into a slice, what we're doing is saying, let's divide it into such a small section that we can approximate it by pretending that this function is constant on the little section we're interested in. So the same thing applies here. We say, okay, if this force is changing, if, say, as we drag this cart, stuff falls off the back, and so the weight changes and the force changes, what we can do is we can divide this distance into tiny little segments, and on each segment, we can assume for a second that that segment is so narrow that the force might as well be constant as it moves that fraction of an inch. So we can have something like delta x on one little section. And on that segment, we can assume force is constant for a minute. And then we can calculate the work done on that segment, add it to the segment after it, and the one after that, and so on, and add all of these up. So in that case, we would say something like the work equals the sum of all of those individual forces times the little distances where those forces apply. And having seen this a few times, this doesn't surprise you that we're going to change this approximation into an exact answer by letting delta x go to zero. And the summation symbol becomes an integral. f will now be a function of x because it's a constantly changing thing and we're looking at different force values at different points along this trajectory. And delta x becomes dx. So this is the general formula for work. It's the integral of the force function. Now as we look at examples of calculating work, the goal is going to be to find this force function. Just like when we calculated volumes, the focus of the problem was in finding the area function, the function of the cross-sectional areas. Now we're looking for the force function. Specifically, we're going to do three types of problems. We're going to start with springs, and we'll talk more about this in a minute, but for springs, we're going to think about the work done in stretching or compressing a spring. And if you've played around with springs at all, you know that as you stretch it, the force changes, because as it gets stretched more or compressed more, it resists that stretching or compressing more and more. So that force is changing, and it changes in a very predictable way, so it turns out that the force function is pretty simple in that case. So that problem won't be very difficult once you know what the force function is there. Then we'll talk about specific problems where we're lifting something. And I mentioned an example here where if we lift a 50 pound bag four feet, the work is easy. So we'll talk about a special kind of lifting problem where the thing that you're lifting changes in weight as you do so. Specifically, we'll use the example of pulling a heavy cable up. And as you pull that heavy cable up, you're pulling up less and less of it as you go because some of it gets coiled up next to you as you pull it up over the edge. So we'll do that example. And that will lead us right into the last of these three, which is the work done in pumping a fluid out of a tank. We'll use water. As you pump water out of a tank, basically you're just lifting that water, but the water needs to get lifted different distances. So for springs, the force function will be known. And that's pretty easy. For lifting, we're going to need to think about how the force function changes as the weight changes. And then for pumping, really the idea is that 
water will weigh the same at all the, all the points in the tank, but some amount of the water has to be lifted further than the other. And so really it's going to be like the distance changes as well as sometimes the force. And that will make more sense as we see examples. So don't worry too much about that just now, but that's just a little preview of where we're headed. We're looking for these three types of problems, calculating the work in each case.